Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of National Security and International Affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from Dr. Mara Kodakiewicz. Dr. Hodakevich holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics and leads IWP's Center for Intermarium Studies. At IWP, he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He is the author of Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hodakiewicz, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's business as usual at the Institute of World Politics. Um, today we'll continue with our story of the Intermarium. Last time we met, I was very upset because of the armistice. Essentially, the Allied agreed for Germany to walk away scot-free. Within three months or so of the armistice, a legend spread, a myth spread in Germany and then elsewhere that essentially Germany was victorious in World War I. Its troops were next to Moscow and close to Paris. So what was the reason for their failure ultimately? Well, the myth that emerged was one of the stab in the back. You see, the Germans won, but someone stabbed them in the back from within. And the answer was, it was the Jews and Freemasons. Had the American and other Allied troops marched in a victory parade in Berlin in 1918, no German would have, would have deluded himself that was Jews and Freemasons who stabbed them in the back and ended the war. Germany, lost the war because it collapsed. Unfortunately, liberals such as David Lloyd George let them off the hook. And Germany was this close from essentially dominating the world and winning. Yet it lost, it, most, it mostly lost because of the United States, but not because before Germany uh, contributed mightily to Russia's implosion and great tragedy of the revolution and civil war. Today, I would like to backtrack a little bit and talk about the German and Austro-Hungarian occupation of the Intermarium uh, between 1915 and 1919. We're now focusing more in our story, we're done discussing general and abstract issues such as um, uh, national self-determination. So we're moving on to uh, a more detailed presentation. This one will be about the German and Austro-Hungarian occupation of the Intermarium, 1915-1919. First, as usual, I have a few quotes. My initial quote is from a poet, Czesław Miłosz, a native of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. He wrote, during World War I, the Germans who took possession of the area tried various formulas of administration playing one nationality against another. It's about World War I. 
My second quote is from General Erich Ludendorff, one of the leading German officers, a warlord. This is his secret directive, Geheim Verordnung, about the plans for the future in the Oberost, that would be the northeastern part of the Intermarium. He, um, he stated this on April 27, 1916. Uh, the Poles, who are notorious for their obstinate resistance to the German colonization, must be discriminated against, and at least a part of them would possibly be removed later. The other native inhabitants, Lithuanians and Belarusians in particular, must be favored in order to gain their sympathy for the Germans. Next in line is a, a letter of Bogdan Count von Hutenchapsky, a Prussian plenipotentiary in the general government or the Kingdom of Poland to the Second Reich's Chancellor, Theobald von Bentham Holweg. The letter is dated January 12th, 1917. And this is what uh, von Hutenchapsky wrote. The great difficulty is that in Lithuania, a completely different policy is followed and the Poles are discriminated against in the strongest way in favor of Lithuanians, Belarusians, and Jews. As the restoration of the Polish-Lithuanian Union is the principal demand of the overwhelming majority of the population of both countries, the uh, mistreat mistreatment of the Lithuanian Poles is badly influencing the Warsaw General Government. A, a Lithuanian historian, Vejas Gabriel Lulevicius, in his Warland on the Eastern Front, wrote as follows. The answer seem to lie in the concept and slogan of German work, Deutsche Arbeit. A characteristically German kind of work would give German lines and features to the lands, putting their stamp on the place, changing it so that the occupiers would at last recognize themselves in the transformed territories. German work shaped and ordered drew borders rationalized, defined, oversaw, channeled energies. Thus, the army would change the place, giving German form to foreign alien content. The source of the slogan was Wilhelm Heinrich Riel's Die Deutsche Arbeit of 1861. The real significance of Riel's contribution lay not in its bombastic argumentation but in the formulation itself, the title alone was of greatest consequences, burrowing into pop popular imagination. The term German work was taken up in political writing at least a decade before the war in reference to colonial activities. It truly came into its own in the war as a way of expressing hopes that this conflict was not merely destructive but a chance for Germans to build a new world. In the East, the term was further charged in the formulation of Kulturarbeit, ultra work, taken up by the administration's spokesmen, coupled with the powerful complex of Kultur. In the East, notions of German work and cultural work were fused, for, for they were self evidently one and the same. Germans of the Kaiserreich define themselves, not without pathos given the imperfect result, as a state-building people. 
The German then was someone who administered and gave order. Through German work, Germans would find it, would find for themselves an identity justifying their own presence in the East. All this would be achieved by, by their quintessential institution, the army. The occupiers repeated the, te- the term Kultur over and over as an explanation of their presence. It rang through the administration's official and propagandistic documents, permeating the military state's self-presentation. Ultimately, this meant that the means of German work justified any ends in this tabula rasa of the East. Jesse Kaufman noted that whatever concessions of the uh, whatever concessions the Germans made, they were unlikely to dispel the suspicion, mistrust, and generalized hostility to the Germans that existed in occupied Poland. On the other hand, what was perceived in Poland as half-hearted duplicity was seen in Germany as the very essence of reckless Polonophilia. So long as the war lasted, it could, could not have been otherwise. So here you go, a few quotes essential to encapsulate the nature of Germany's occupation in the Intermarium from 1915. And we shall concentrate mainly here on the northern part of the Intermarium under the German occupations. What the Germans encountered was a situation which they referred to with derision as Polish economy, or Polish Wirtschaft, namely lack of proper economic organization. They were the carriers of the torch of culture to the East, called themselves Kulturträger. This was the most important role justifying all moves by the Second Reich, and in particular, its Prussian-style army. Only after the occupied environment would have been transformed the German way, all the geopolitical schemes of Berlin could have been fulfilled. To understand a deeper sense of this enterprise, we shall now describe not only the Intermarium, but also crucial component parts which um, occupied the eastern part of the German and Austro-Hungarian state. They all they likewise impacted geopolitics and occupation politics and foreign policy of both the Habsburg and Hohenzollern realms. This concerns mainly the Polish lands which were partitioned at the end of the 18th century. Polish lands in the west and southwest. We also shall sketch here general, a general outline of the victorious progress of central states from the Baltic, through the Balkans, up to the Alps, so that we could understand a broader context where the Kingdom of Poland and the uh, seized lands, Ziemia Zabrane, or the so-called Oberost, fit under the German 
power. What the Poles treated as a unitary phenomenon, Rzeczpospolita, their Commonwealth, the Russians, Germans, and Austrians considered uh, as territories that could be divided at anyone's whim and in accordance with one's interest. Therefore, we must differentiate each belonging under a foreign set scepter of separate partitioning areas which had been under foreign rule from the end of the 18th century. We must look at those lands which shifted as a result of various conflicts, including Napoleonic Wars, from one partitioning power to the next. And we must remember how this system was essentially solidified by the Treaty of Vienna. So, in accordance with such conditions, during World War I, we understand by the German occupation, all Polish terrains claimed from the Romanovs by the Hohenzollern and Habsburgs. Both encountered a very difficult heritage of the Russian occupation that had lasted over 100 years. The, the heritage was exacerbated by the repressions following the November Rising of 1830 and the January Rising of 1863. The conditions, however, were somewhat soothed by limited concessions and conditional liberalization in the wake of the revolution of 1905. But even those concessions and liberalization were toned down gradually by the czarist authorities afterwards. In conjunction with this, for political, social, and economic reasons, no native, national, or ethnocultural group in the intermarium was satisfied with the status quo in the empire of the czars. Symbolic declarations of St. Petersburg in 1914, say, toward the nod towards the Poles, failed to inspire anybody too much. Yet, each national group separately approached the new occupiers of the intermarium differently. In other words, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians inherited greatly suspicious Poles, passive or hostile Orthodox Ruthenians and locals, as well as Jews, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, and others who were full of hope as far as the new occupation was concerned. The victors, conquerors, did not incorporate the new terrain, the newly captured lands into their empires directly. They eschewed 
joining those lands in an administrative manner to the adjacent Polish lands which were included in the Prussian and Austrian partition. The conquerors always treated their the captured land separately. This stemmed from their worries about a possible destabilization of their own state, and in particular fears about the reaction of the Polish minority under the rule of Vienna and Berlin. The occupation politics of central powers on Polish lands captured from Russia always referred foremostly to internal affairs of the victors and the fear of an uncontrolled explosion of Polish assertiveness presented itself permanently before the eyes of the leaders of the Habsburg and Hohenzollern monarchies. To a large extent, the military occupation politics applied towards the Kingdom of Poland and the captured lands in the East was a continuation of the partitioning policy before, from before 1914. So let us stop for a little while to consider both the Prussian and Austrian Partition. The Prussian partition consisted of Wielkopolska, Great Poland, Pomorze, Pomerania, Mazur, East Prussia, and Shlonsk, Silesia. They were, they continued to be administered within the Prussian kingdom, which was the dominant part of the Second Reich. These Polish lands incorporated in the imperial system were economically prosperous and rather wealthy. Under duress, they naturally supported the German war effort, not only with um, hundreds of thousands of recruits, but also with Silesian uh, coal and industry and the Wielkopolski and Pomorski uh, uh, agriculture. The latter increased in importance in proportion to the success of the Allied blockade of the Central Powers. The Prussian partition, even during the war, continued to be subject to the official policy of, of Germanization. It was based on state intervention to support the German element and various undertakings of social engineering intended to discriminate the Polish minority, which was majority in those lands in the East. Bismarckian Kulturkampf contained strong anti-Catholic elements as well as nationalists, but future official Prussian undertakings, for instance, uh, whole hating organization Hakata, were blemished 
by increasing chauvinism and racism. Berlin, in particular, concentrated on education and property rights. Polish children were even barred from praying in Polish at school. While the Poles were not allowed to sell land and uh, real estate freely. Sometimes the Germans even forbade them from building a house on their own property. Uh, the German minority enjoyed all sorts of government largesse and perks to encourage them to settle. And as I said, mostly through uh, state subsidies to settle in the East, in the Prussian partition of Poland. Politically, Prussian Poles were mostly affiliated with national democracy, although in Silesia, Christian democracy dominated. The representation of the Polish minority in the parliament in Berlin, however, was incapable of influencing the events. And only in a lively way, it would register its opposition to the anti-Polish policy of the Second Reich, not only in the Prussian partition, but everywhere in the lands of the old Commonwealth. Although they were poor and economically undeveloped, politically the Poles were very influential in the Austrian partition. They were much more influential in the Austrian partition than in the Prussian one. They dominated Galicia, and their influences only decreased during the First World War. This had to do with a uh, few issues. First of all, Galicia found itself on the first line of the front, and the, the local civilian organization, uh, the local civilian administration, which had been dominated by the Poles before the war, had to yield to um, military authorities. Second, between 1914 and 1916, a large chunk of the Austrian partition found itself under the Russian occupation. The occupier targeted local independent structures, which happened to be primarily Polish. The Moscovites also destroyed Ukrainian nationalism, but because Polish nationalism and its institutions were much more developed, so the losses of the Poles under the new policy of Russification, repression, exploitation were much greater. Third, because of the apparent weakness of the Austro-Polish solution and an ever increasing subordination of uh, Vienna to Berlin, the Poles, even Polish socialists, increasingly tended to shift to the opposition vis-a-vis -vis the Austrian government, favoring national solidarity over narrow class interests. Polish influences in the Habsburg monarchy gradually decreased. The best 
illustration of this phenomenon is the lack of a Polish delegation during the negotiations in Brest-Litovsk in 1917 and 1918. Another illustration is the uh, choosing of the Ukrainian option, which was tantamount to rejecting uh, the Polish card by the Germans and Austrians. It discriminated the Poles. The result uh, or a, a negative result of this policy was the loss of the helm area by Poland to Ukraine and the Habsburg promise of further pro-Ukrainian concessions in East Galicia and Bukovina. The politicians in Vienna hinted at their amalgamation into a Ukrainian unit, perhaps uh, autonomous, but there were also plans or at least discussions to detach those lands from the Austrian partition and incorporated them into uh, the Ukrainian state. At first, however, it was Habsburg Poles, but not the Hohenzollern Poles, who looked with hope towards towards a, a victory of um, central powers. They expected that with Vienna's support, the Commonwealth would be restored either as a, an independent state or as an equal part of uh, uh, the Habsburg monarchy. In this scheme, the Habsburg state would consist of three parts, Austrian, Hungarian, and Polish, Slavic. Thus, the support for the Habsburgs, not only with military recruits directly, as a result of which nearly one million Poles served in the uh, uh, Imperial Royal Armies, but also organizational effort, which expressed itself in creating the Polish legions subordinated to the Austro-Hungarian forces. And the legions were supposed to be a harbinger of the Polish army to come. Pro-Austrian, this, this pro-Austrian policy gradually started to collapse. And it didn't help that a great part of, of Polish activists switched to um, German sponsorship. After July 1917, most activists led by Joseph Piłsudski abandoned military cooperation with the Second Reich, and as I've mentioned, they, they ignored Austro-Hungary already earlier. Berlin's policy, as well as the policy of uh, Vienna, which was subordinated to Berlin with increasing disinclination approached any pro-Polish solutions. In particular, the most hostile towards the idea of the restoration of 
a Polish state was the Prussian military. And as we know, it was precisely the military that dominated on the lands of the old Commonwealth captured from the Russian Empire. They realized their own plans there, although their maximalism was tempered by the limitations imposed by the court of the Kaiser, the Berlin government, in particular the chancellor's office, and the Auswärtigesamt, uh, the foreign ministry, as well as the parliament. However, the successes on the Eastern Front caused that the German appetite began growing with eating, and that advantaged the army. As far as um, the lands taken over from the defeated Russians in 1916, there were four principal operational zones of the Central Powers along an entire spread or about 2,000 kilometers from their function, a very narrow belt next to the fighting lines. This belt remained outside the jurisdiction of occupational administrative bodies, and the belt was subordinated directly to front units and their general staffs. The belt ran from Perland to the Carpathians and then towards the Black Sea. Its northern portion was controlled by Berlin and the southern by Vienna. Further down south by Sofia and Istanbul. As we've mentioned, to the west of the front belt, in 1915, the Austrians and Hungarians returned to Eastern Gal Gal Galicia they defeated Serbia and Montenegro, and then in 1916, they pushed further, occupying Romanian territories together with the Bulgars and the Turks. Next, the Habsburg armies turned towards the south, southwest, facing the Italian front. Meanwhile, Italy had joined the war on the side of the Allies, but Rome was not blessed with military fortune. Its contribution to the Allied effort war became very costly as far as resources and gold for London and Paris. And it also failed to bear fruit in terms of defeating the efforts of Vienna and Berlin. Italy became an ever, in, uh, an ever increasingly annoying 
hardship to its partners from the downtown. Step by step, Italy was losing, bleeding horribly. At the same time, such developments allowed the central powers to concentrate their forces in the West and in the East. As far as uh, the Eastern Front, on the northern portion of the lands captured by captured by um, Germany from the Russians, the occupiers established two occupation zones. The first one was the Polish kingdom and the other one was the Oberost. The full name of it was Oberbefehlshaber der gesamten deutschen Streitkräfte in, im Osten. Uh, Oberost simply means a large chunk of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the old Grand Duchy of Lithuania, essentially the whole of it, plus what is now, eventually what is now Estonia and Latvia. In the, the, official, the, the official viceroy of the Kingdom of Poland was General Hans von Bessele. Oberost was under the famous team of Feldmarschall Paul von Hindeburg and General Erich Ludendorff. Later, it was their hand-picked success, successors who ran the Oberost. Generally, the leadership of each of the entities, the Polish Kingdom and the Oberost, hated each other and they fought against one another. The main bone of discontent was nationalities policy. In the Polish kingdom, the Poles were favor, favored. In the Oberost, the Lithuanians and the Jews. The occupiers attempted to play each nationality against others according to the classical a formula of divide and rule. The Germans naturally took advantage of pre-existing uh, prejudices and uh, quarrels. At the same time, both occupation centers competed for blessings from Berlin. This oftentimes resulted in uh, cacophony, if you will, in German uh, policy. Therefore, one of the most prominent German officials in the Oberost, an old Russian Pole hater and anti-Semite captain Wilhelm Freiherr von Geil openly stated that between his collaborators in the Oberost and the Besseler team, there was a state of war from the beginning to the end. At any rate, the internal quarrels among the German occupiers were expedited by a fact that the Eastern Front, this portion, froze for almost two years. So the Prussians would experiment accordingly on the local people. However, at the beginning of 1917, the Kaiser troops pushed further east beyond the Minsk region and they entered 
uh, the Ukrainian lands from Kiev in the center to Odessa in the south, as well as Kharkov or Kharkiv in the east. Following the east of Brest-Litovsk in February 1918, the German occupation, uh, occupation zone increased greatly by lands which extended beyond even the terrains of the first partition of the Commonwealth. Meanwhile, Austro-Hungarian war effort was increasingly crippled. The Germans were forced to take increasingly on themselves the weight of fight and occupation. As a result, when the imperial and royal politicians complained about Prussian when they complained about Prussian domination and anti-Catholicism and arrogance, uh, their partners considered the uh, Habsburg alliance as being tied to a corpse. Pro proportionally to the German military success, their geopolitical appetites grew as well. Initially, Berlin ignored Polish issues or at least allowed Vienna to spin its plans of Austro, of the Austro-Polish solution or solutions. At the same time, for a longer spell, Germany's top elites believed that it was not worth it to antagonize St. Petersburg by supporting independentist plans of the Poles. An immediate aim of Germany was to sign a separate peace treaty with Russia, so the so-called Polish question was almost totally marginalized by the Germans. Their main concern was to draft Polish recruits and exploit Poles economically. However, in conjunctions with the German victories in the East, the powers that be in the Second Reich began to reconsider their plans in the Intermarium. As mentioned, some influential Polar, uh, German circles continued to stress their dogmatic pro-Russian stance, although others considered a variety of other options from moderately hegemonic, which were contained in various variants of the concept of Mittel Europa, all the way to ultra-imperialist and hyper-annexationist, which reached all the way to St. Petersburg, Crimea, the Caucasus, and even further. Already in 1915, in the captured Western ter territories belonging to the Russian Empire, a uh, peculiar condominium of the central power came into existence. 
the Austro-Hungarian forces took the Lublin area. Vienna did not incorporate those lands to its Galician partition, but it administered them separately. As far as Germany, as mentioned, it organized a separate administrative unit from parts of the so-called Vistula country of the Russian partition, so central Poland. So Berlin incorporated, uh, Berlin created a unit consisting of Kielecizna, Mazowsze, and a part of Podlasia. This was what would become known as the Polish, uh, the Kingdom of Poland. To the northwest from Warsaw, between the uh, between the Grodno area and Kurland, that was the Oberost. It occupied the Lithuanian uh, and Belarusian lands, which were parts of the second partition of the Commonwealth. German authorities in the Polish kingdom played the Polish card. In time, the local German authorities decided that the Poles should be prepared by them for independence, which means that a Polish state ought to be resurrected as a satellite of the Second Reich with internal autonomy. Therefore, by the act of November 5th, 1916, the Germans officially announced the creation of the Polish kingdom on the western fringes of the German occupation. Naturally, uh, the Germans did not incorporate into this entity the Polish lands of the Prussian partition, so Poznania, Pomerania, uh, nor did they even consider incorporating uh, the terrains of the Austrian partition in the so-called Galicia. And again, the Lublin area, which was occupied by Vienna, likewise remained outside of the Polish kingdom. This entity was headed by, all the time, by the German military and civilian administration, which was led by General Governor von Bessele. Only in the fall of 1917, the Germans created so-called Regency Council for the kingdom, which consisted of Poles. The Regency Council supervised a government cabinet, which was appointed and not elected. No monarch was either elected or even appointed or considered by name. Uh, some hinted that a German prince should be put on the throne. This caused great discomfort to Austria-Hungary, which already had a Habsburg candidate for Poland. However, the perspectives for the Austro-Polish solution continued to fade away. The 
Berlin concept of a puppet Polish state realized itself in practice, but very slowly. Because the Prussians were disappointed by the lack of Polish volunteers for cannon fodder for the Kaiser, they greatly hesitated to allow the development of the structures of the Polish state. This, in turn, caused a chronic political crisis in the Polish kingdom. Generally, for a long time, the Polish lefts and national minorities tended to support the Germans, and in particular, Austro-Hungarians. This started changing only very gradually. But the change, reorientation, accelerated after the outbreak of the February Revolution in Russia in 1917. Now even the Polish right, except to an extent the uh, uh, the nationalists, the National Democrats, in the so-called Vistula country. Even the Polish right started looking at Germany as a defender against the revolution. Simultaneously, a disappointed left re-evaluated its approach to Berlin and Vienna as Viktor Sukhenitsky, the great Viktor Sukhenitsky, put it very aptly, having gained substantial support from the right wing, the occupying authorities became less politically dependent upon the left wing activists who definitely went into opposition at the beginning of July 1917. The occupying authorities could not, on, could not only suppress this opposition uh, by radical administrative measure, but could also neglect it politically and continue their labors in building a Polish kingdom on a quite different social political basis. The, the opposition supplied uh, the, the opposition uh, concerned all leftist options, including the Vistulian internationalist left and the Polish independentist socialists, populists, and uh, various uh, progressive liberals. The cosmopolitan option supported the revolution and it hoped that it would uh, spread to the Polish kingdom and the whole of Europe. The national socialist option and its derivatives felt increasingly frustrated with the lack of success of their policy of collaboration with the central powers. They achieved virtually nothing despite greatly aiding Vienna and Berlin. The fiasco of this policy was contrasted with great losses and sacrifices which the Poles suffered fighting hand in hand with other soldiers of two emperors, in particular in reference to the Polish legions, which were usually associated with uh, Joseph Piłsudski. Upon hearing about the revolution in St. Petersburg, Polish independentist forces continued not to trust Russia, but they were they rejoiced because of the collapse of the Tsar, the Tsarist government. Only after the Bolshevik takeover did 
Polish progressives, both factions of uh, the Polish Socialist Party supported the communists and functioned within the framework sanctioned by the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union or in Soviet Russia. Not so much in Poland. In Soviet Russia, after a while, the Polish Socialist Party Revolutionary Fraction, which used to be affiliated with Piłsudski, withdrew from cooperation in the Bolsheviks. However, the Polish Socialist Party left, joined the social democracy of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania to create a communist party strictly subordinated to the Bolshevik one. Their agentura in Poland operated according to uh, Kremlin orders at least from the beginning of 1918. Until that time, nobody ex except the extremists did not expect that the salvation for Poland would come from the East. It was doubtful, however, that the salvation would generate itself from the side of the central powers. Instead of that, in Berlin's Polish policy, we witnessed slow dripping of concessions, so slow trickling down of concessions. But ultimately, my dreams of independence, Polish dreams of independence, never realized themselves in this context. Always, however, the concessions fulfilled strategic aims of the Second Reich. It is obvious that the act of the 5th of November creating the Polish kingdom was aimed against Russia. The Tsar proved quite incapable of an unequivocal declaration about Polish independence. He limited himself to nebulous, unimportant promises about uniting all the Polish lands under the scepter of the Romanovs. That means he talked about annexing, incorporating the territories of the Russian and Austrian partitions to the Russian partition, which would be limited to the so-called Vistula country within some kind of, uh, again, nebulous autonomous system. But the act of November 5th was also a, a part of um, uh, postulates presented to, presented by uh, the central powers uh, and extended as a, as a uh, peace offer to the United States. I remember, in 1916, the United States was not in the war yet. Uh, Washington attempted to play an intermediary in negotiations to achieve the end of this increasingly bloody and stalemated war by inserting the so-called Polish question the Germans attempted to dupe the United States. America favored a peace without annexations, but it also was favorable towards the idea of um, um, self-determination of nations. Thus, this allegedly independent Poland, supported by Berlin, established by the act of November 5th, meant that the, 
the, the terrain of the Russian Empire would be incorporated into the German zone de facto under the guise of creating an independent Polish state. In reality, this was going to be a satellite mainly of the Second Reich because the Austro-Hungarians counted less and less in the grand scheme of things. In this international context, it appeared that the Germans became the main dealers of the Polish card. But Berlin was incapable of deciding un, on an unequivocal policy that would be logical and consequently create facts on the ground solving the Polish question. The court, the government, the parliament and military kept juggling a variety of options. But at the same time, they quarreled incessantly, in particular because powerful individuals, players, exerted themselves to put their brand on their favorite option in Germany's Polish policy. As we've mentioned, both administrative units in the German occupation on the second and third uh, partition of the Commonwealth carried out contradictory policies. Policies that clashed. Von Bessler, as a matter of routine, would meet with the Hindeburg Ludensdorf team and then with their successors. As mentioned, the German authorities in the Polish kingdom supported the Poles. In particular, on the educational and cultural field, the German policy was pro Polish. Therefore, the Germans removed many Russian decrees which paralyzed independence undertakings of the Polish civil society. For example, officially the Polish language was finally allowed and Polish children could finally study in their mother tongue at school. The Polish university was open in Warsaw but as a, as a, a concession or in turn for all those concessions, the Germans ruthlessly exploited the population of the kingdom economically. And without much success, the occupation authorities endeavored to conduct a recruitment drive to the so-called Polish armed forces, Polnische Wehrmacht. those forces were supposed to fight on the side of central powers. Meanwhile, their colleagues from the Ober Ost 
also carried out a policy of maximum economic mobilization and mobilization of forced labor. And at the same time, from the very beginning, the Oberost carried out an ever increasing policy of Germanization. This reflected successes on the front, as well as long-term geopolitical plans of German military leaders. The German language was not only the official language of the Oberost, but from June 1st, 1918, it also functioned as the basic language of all grade schools, elementary schools, beginning with uh, first grade. And that arrangement concerned all enslaved ethnic groups. However, as far as um, um, uh, nationalities policy, the Oberost marched in a different direction than the go uh, government general. Despite the fact that the population tally of 1916 conducted by Berlin showed that the czarist census of 1897 greatly decreased the number of Poles in the captured territories, von Hindenburg and Ludendorff rejected a possibility of any agreement with the Polish element. Instead, the Germans carried out in the borderlands the policy of suppressing the Poles to the benefit of other ethnicities, in particular the Lithuanians. Two quite different policies were applied in Warsaw and in Vilna. While in Warsaw, a definite effort had been made to gain the sympathy of the Poles for Germany, the policy of the Oberost authorities was becoming more and more anti-Polish. This tendency sharpened following the revolution in Russia in February 1917, and in particular after the Peace of Brest in March 1918, when it became obvious then uh, uh, the Germans no longer needed Polish recruits to throw Polish cannon fodder against the Russian armies. This anti-Polish policy led to the construction of the foundations of a Lithuanian nation state. Perhaps as an afterthought, both the Jews and the Belarusians were favored at the expense of the Poles. While the Poles were discriminated, the Belarusians were rather ignored, and the Jews were treated as an anti-Polish uh, trading card in relations with the Lithuanians. Sometimes they were even encouraged to call to uh, uh, sometimes the Germans even encourage to co-opt Jews to Lithuanian institutions which were sanctioned by the occupier. As far as uh, Belarusian statehood or Jewish autonomy, however, Berlin ignored the postulates of the first and the demands of the others, uh, the Germans would fit tactically to their own needs. This was, after all, a general rule, which um, 
apply to the German to the Jewish community from all sides, everywhere in the intermarium. The occupiers limited themselves to gestures, promises, and narrow concessions for everyone, and to certain privileges to um, dynamic individuals. Jews were seen sometimes through a prism of anti-Semitism, but uh, much more frequently through the lens of cultural compatibility, in particular because of the Yiddish, uh, and because of anti, of, of, of their anti-Russian attitude, or more um, uh, precisely, anti-Tsarist attitude. Initially, the local Jews who uh, cooperated with the Berlin government rather close, and then not the local Jews, but uh, the German Jews who um, initially cooperated with the uh, Berlin government rather clo close, supported the radicalization of their intermarium co-religionists as a part of the German general plan to revolutionize persecuted minorities of the Tsarist Empire, as uh, Walter Lecour wrote. In, uh, uh, in characteristically uh, with a characteristically extremist tone, there were leaflets spread on the eve of the German attack towards the east. Here is one sample: Jews of Russia, rise, spring to arms. Help hunt the Moscow, Russian, out of the West, out of Poland, Lithuania, White Russia, Volhynia, and Podolia. Freedom is coming from Europe. This is totally instrumental. Such leaflets were distributed everywhere on the front by German soldiers. This undertaking initially was supported by German general or some German general Zionists. Let us add that the most active Germanophiles among the Zionists were excluded from international uh, from international Zionist ruling bodies because a Zionist organization essentially proclaimed neutrality in the conflict. By the way, we should stress that this plan also concerned the radicalization of Poles and Ukrainians, not only the Jews. In this sense, it turned out that the Jewish community was not treated in any special way in uh, German political games. The leaders of the Jewish community understood this only gradually, and they developed restraint as far as support for the central powers, but only over time restraint. Initially to encourage Jewish collaboration, the Second Reich granted Jews rather limited concessions. Among other things, in the Oberos, the Russian discriminatory anti-Jewish laws, legislations, decrees were removed. However, they were simultaneously replaced with general legal and economic regulations that discriminated against the Jews along uh, with the rest of the population. Therefore, the leaders 
organizations of the Jewish community and the Jewish people in general soon felt disappointed in relations with Germany. Their disinclination would increase gradually. Frequent confiscations of property, forced labor, and various economic restrictions, along with the general collapse of production and trade uh, caused by the war and the Allied blockade, pushed the Jews to desperation. And for the broad masses, Jewish masses, the situation was hardly different despite the successes of a very narrow group of wealthy uh, Jewish entrepreneurs who were able to uh, uh, economically capitalize on the occupation. In addition, in the key matter of political autonomy, the representatives of the Jewish community failed to win much from the Germans. In the Oberost, they experienced concessions on the field of secular culture and education in the, in, in the Yiddish language and religious and Hebrew. In the Polish kingdom, despite the fact that the German authorities supported Judaistic religious education. The Germans refused to, to back the Jewish endeavors to, uh, to uh, achieve the official recognition of the Jewish ethnocultural group as a nation. On the contrary, the German authorities supported the stance of the Orthodox. And the Orthodox Jews were in, in, in supported here also by the uh, assimilationist and Polish Christian voices to continue to treat Jewry as a religious group, not as a nation. Next, the German policy of the rebirth or of restoration, gradual restoration of the Polish state in the Polish kingdom caused alienation of the local minorities, especially Jews. And the Jewish people initially supported the German occupier. But now, having had experienced a certain degree of favoritism following the initial entry of the armies of the Kaiser, the Jews counted on some kind of autonomy, even territorial autonomy. But they overestimated, they miscalculated. The Jews may have suffered under the Russian rule, but this didn't mean that they, except for the few remaining assimilationists, were particularly happy about exchanging Russian rulers for Polish ones. An understandable fear given the intensity of Polish anti-Semitism, says Jesse Kaufman. A, notwithstanding this, notwithstanding the fact that this appears like a classical situation of, um, of an egg and a chicken, what was first, anti-Jewishness or anti polonism we cannot deny the reality of a conflict of interest here.
the Jews did not rejoice for being placed in a position subordinate to the Poles. They felt significant resentment because of economic and social boycott carried out under the aegis of national democracy. Even though the boycott was not very effective, its cultural dimension fueled the antagonism of the Jewish society toward Polish independentist France. Perhaps this was the only point on which most Polish jury agreed in its mass. Aside such sentiments, there didn't exist some kind of a general Jewish consensus. Various milieus and parties preached various programs. Like the Poles, the Jews were quite divided ideologically, politically, and religiously. The assimilators who were on the defensive, or as they were called, Poles of Mosaic faith, constituted a, a quickly vanishing margin of the society. Religious Orthodox endeavored to neutralize politically, socially, and economically the challenges of modernity which were crushing their community. Therefore, they supported all power centers who would allow them to maintain their ethno-religious hermeticism while simultaneously guaranteeing cultural autonomy. The Zionists dreamt about Zion, but they failed to agree to its nature. And they didn't always agree to its location. All of them, in theory, considered that the Jewish state should, should um, be erected in Palestine. However, in practice, there was a complete lack of unity in the Jewish society. At one point, it was divided by the so-called Uganda option. There was no only correct, politically correct, Zionist strategy or no Jewish strategy. There was chaos propelled by war and radicalism. Some even considered uh, the possibility that Zion should be built in Poland. Most Zionist orientations and most of their supporters were becoming under the radicalizing pressure of the war to a, to a various degree, socialists, they were becoming socialists. So most Zionist orientations stressed that the Jewish state ought to have a socialist character. character. So the, uh, within the Zionist orientations, there was also, there was therefore a conflict of the religious Zionist right uh, with liberal Zionists all the way to leftist socialists, including revolutionary extremi uh, uh, extremists who would soon be recognized as national Bolsheviks. Socialist options were becoming ever stronger with the economic collapse of the country in conjunction with uh, the pauperization of the masses and increasing radicalization and secularization of the intelligentsia. The Zionists agreed at least 
about the primacy of the Hebrew language in their project. But ideas similar to um, leftist or leftist Zionists were entertained by the so-called folk folkists or leftist populists, sharply socialist. They rejected the Hebrew language and believed that Yiddish is the Jewish national tongue. On the left side, the greatest competition versus socialist Zionists and Falkists was the Marxist boom. Generally, its members adhered to social democracy and agreed to parliamentarism. However, under the impact of World War I and the revolution, within the Bund, just like among socialist Zionists, Zionists and the Falkers, there were quite advanced radicalizing processes. And very many rank and file members, as well as a certain number of the leading cadres, welcome the revolution with great enthusiasm and without any hesitation joined it. Meanwhile, the Jewish assimilation, uh, assimilationists, orthodox, and at least some liberals, the revolution appeared as, as an unmitigated horror. And this was the same case with the Poles. But as far as the Poles are concerned, many of them uh, suffered of a tendency to see the revolution through the stereotypical cliche of the Judo Komuna, Jewish Bolshevism, Jewish communism. In addition, the Poles, however, were not satisfied with limited concessions limited German concessions, and they demanded concrete deeds, not only uh, empty uh, declarations about the future independence of Poland. Both the German occupiers and their Polish uh, collaborations, collaborationists or the Poles who uh, uh, followed the German orientation line, calculated that the Polish state, state ought to emerge from the war as a monarchy. At first, they banked on, on, on the Austrian option, but in 1917, they shifted to the German option in congruence with the changes dictated by Berlin. The Germans naturally were going to create a, uh, a, a, a tiny, puppet state. However, the abandoning of the Austrian option meant that the Poles could no longer count on incorporating even Galicia to the future puppet state. And as uh, the piece of breast showed, the Polish kingdom was further uh, truncated by detaching the helm area, which proved unequivocally that the Polish card was not a priority for Berlin. Germany simply extended the policy of, uh, of Oberos to favor Ukraine in exchange for its ruthless economic exploitation. It was then revealed that German military authorities stress, stressed the necessity to create a common Ukrainian-Lithuanian border. This put a huge question mark over any expansion of the Polish kingdom eastwards. Further, Vienna, motivated by the panic 
created by hunger, which propelled the internal revolution in the Habsburg state, in secret negotiations, promised the Ruthenians autonomy for Eastern Galicia, as well as the co-optation of Ukrainians to the Habsburg imperial system, according to the rule of parity. This, all of this was supposed to be at the expense of the Poles. The developments triggered a serious crisis in the Polish kingdom and in Galicia, although also in Silesia, Wielkopolska and Pomerania, where Polish activists of all orientations violently objected against the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Hitherto playing the central powers card, so-called Polish activists were divided into conservatives and monarchists, as well as progressives and socialists. The last orientation remained faithful to Józef Piłsudski, uh, commander of one of the brigades under the Austrian um, uh, orders. Within, <clears throat> within the Polish legions. Piłsudski was, however, an unquestioned authority, not only among many legionaries, but also among various emanations of the independentist left. The actions of the commander went up when he objected when he objected against Berlin because of the lack of any concessions. And in July, 1917, he was interned and the units faithful to him were dissolved and interned behind barbed wire. His rival, National Democrat, Roman Dmowski didn't have much influence on the situation in his motherland because he was busy on the diplomatic field in the West. And his nationalist followers at home divided themselves according to, the, to their tempers. The youth rebelled and from the Sokol movement, it joined the legions, remaining, however, in the opposition to Piłsudski. Older index either continued in passivity or at best, they attempted to join selected grassroots initiatives, self-government and community service. They, they further conditionally cooperated with the conservative and monarchical part of the coalition of the activists. Already at the beginning of 1918, the reality in Poland was such that the central powers won World War I. They won the Great War. Very few on the ground at home. felt that this was important, that the United States joined the conflict in 1917. And this was very soon to prove crucial to Germany's collapse. For now, in the general perception in the center and east of Europe, Berlin stood triumphant. Vienna was increasingly powerless, and Piotrograd, Petersburg, appeared to count for less and less. 
Russia with a uh, fearfully horrific speed plunged into the chaos of the revolution. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Dr. Hodakevich and all of you who tuned in. If you're interested in attending other upcoming events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thanks, everyone.